hello out there to everyone. Uh, welcome to Amateur Radio Roundtable. Today is Tuesday, June the 2nd, 2015. Uh, my name is Tom Medlin, W5KUB, and I'm with our co-host tonight, Ted Randall, WB8PUM. Uh, we thank all you guys for joining us tonight. Uh, this webcast is every Tuesday night at 8 o'clock p.m. Central Time, 0100 UTC Wednesdays on W5KUB.com. In addition to watching us at W5KUB.com, this program is also being simulcast on shortwave radio station WTWW in Lebanon, Tennessee on 5085 kilohertz. So this is the second show where we're testing our new chat room. Folks, we, uh, we uh, changed that to uh, plug a security hole that Java had. We hope uh, it's working well for you guys. Hey, each one of you can join us live uh, with your live video on this webcast at the second part of the show. We bring you in on, on, on a Hangout. We'll send you a link, and we can have up to 10 people join us at one time. And uh, being here, just come in, say hello, uh, listen, whatever you want to do. So, hey, real quick, let me shoot it out to Ted. Ted, are you there, or how are you doing tonight, and what have you been up to? I'm, I'm doing fine. Just been busy. I'm sitting here watching, uh, looking at uh, Bob's... Um Hallicrafters t-shirt on the uh, on the Skype uh, video thing. It's it's a very cool t-shirt. <laughs> well, Bob's got a lot of cool things there to tell you. Um, tell you, uh, Bob uh, Bob is a, a very interesting guy, and we're going to talk a lot about him tonight. There, look at that look at that ham shack behind him there. But um, you know, let me let me just kind of give an intro to Bob here and see if I can do it. And I, Bob, if, if any of this is wrong, you, you tell me, okay? So, just want to introduce tonight uh, uh, Bob Heil. Well, let me see if I can get him on the, the screen here with us. Uh, yeah, this is Bob Heil, K9EID. Uh, Bob is a sound and radio engineer, most well known for creating the template for modern rock sound systems. He founded the Heil Sound in 1966 and went on to create unique touring sound systems for bands such as the Grateful Dead and the Who. Bob has been a great innovator in the field of amateur radio, manufacturing microphones and satellite dishes for broadcasters and live sound engineers. Uh, he has won multiple awards and honors, and in 2007, he became the first manufacturer to be invited to exhibit at the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Wow. Uh, Bob's also host of Ham Nation. It's a ham webcast, which can be seen live Wednesday nights on Twit TV. And I'd just like to say Bob's been a great supporter of our webcast since we started doing it about 13 years ago. So how are you doing, Bob? I am doing really well, and I want to say hello to Ted and all of his family down in the, in the Tennessee area. Ted, it's good to hear your voice. Good to see you, buddy. I hope everything's okay there. And it's nice to be here. It's a... Uh, been a, a long run trying to get into here. We've tried, or you've tried several times, and I'm always out somewhere. That's my problem. <laughs> I, I don't stay in one place long enough because everybody's kind of tugging at me to do this, do that. And uh, no is not my vocabulary, so we go out and try to help uh, some of these guys and gals that have trouble out there on the road getting things to sound right, as well as take care of all the ham radio stuff that we do. And, of course, ham radio is... It's it's been my whole education. I uh, I started when I was a teenager. In 1956, I got my license because one of my high school chums was getting his license, and I thought that was pretty interesting. And it was kind of a a, a very uh, very interesting circumstance of how I found out about that. I. I was playing the accordion when I was 10. Now, in the 1950s, everybody was, I think everybody played accordion. <laughs> but my uh, parents thought I should have a Hammond organ. Hammond came out with a really cool instrument back in 50, 51. They took an accordion and split it in half, the buttons on one side and the keys on the other side of the keyboard. It was, very, it was called the uh, uh, S6 was the model. And it was a Hammond chord organ, and it was really cool. Well, she went to buy one of those, and uh, God bless the salesman. He talked her into buying a B3. <laughs> uh, as a 12-year-old kid, I took to that like a, like I take to ham radio. I, I, I was just 
mesmerized by all the things you could do with a B3 Hammond organ. Uh, actually, it was a C, a C model. It had uh, straight sides on it. But I, uh, two years later, I got a job playing in a restaurant uh, on the weekends, making a lot of money. It was like, whoa. I'm going, okay. And then a year later, another blessing hit me. I became the substitute organist at the Fox Theater. There's a picture of that. Uh, I was 15 years old, and uh, this organ was uh, it was amazing uh, that uh, I had this opportunity to become the organist uh, at the Fox along with Stan Can. He became a great mentor for me. What was about this? Now you got to understand. At the same time that's going on, ham radio was very, very important to my life. But that organ hadn't been played in about twenty years, and he needed somebody to help him tune and voice it. He needed somebody to hold the keys down there, and he's up on the fifth floor with thousands, about six thousand pipes. And we had to voice and tune that thing. Here's just a few of them. This was taken not too many years ago. Those are actually brass trumpets. They had flutes and clarinets. And these are all driven by air. Big, big blowers down in the basement of the theaters. And I uh, I was just incredibly enhanced with all of that. Now, what was important about that is that's where I learned to listen Bob Heil learned to listen. That's very important. And I didn't know it at the time, what kind of an impact that would have on my life later on. Listening is a mental process. Uh, hearing, everybody hears. But not a lot of people listen. They don't close their eyes and listen to all the harmonic content of what's going on way up here or way down here. I always get a kick out of people. Well, why you build a headphone in the hi-fi industry that goes to 24,000 cycles? Nobody hears that. Yes, you do. You hear the harmonics of that that drop down into where you can hear. Same thing with the ham radio. But I learned to listen, and that was just a huge part of my, my careers. But then in the, I, I got my license because my friend got his license, K9DTQ, well, I became KN9EID, and I didn't stay a novice very long because I really didn't care for the code, and I got a technician license. And my first amateur radio station was a Harvey Wells, TBS 50D, Hallicrafter receiver, SX99, and a big box in the corner was a VHF converter. It took... 14 megacycles and turned it into six and two meters. So that converter allowed the uh, HF uh, SX99 to listen to six and two meters. I became mesmerized with VHF. I still have that transmitter. I don't know if you guys can see it, but it's right down here. I'm on the air with it a lot in the morning uh, on AM. It's still with me. Almost all of the gear behind me uh, we'll go through that after a while. That uh, most all of it has been with me since its envision of day one when I. Well, hey, hey, Bob, it. let me let me ask you a question it's real not, quick, man. Did your parents? Uh, ha they must have really supported you. I've got a picture here. Let me switch to it. I've got a picture here, uh, and I just put it on. Here's a picture of. I guess that's you on top of a tower with 144 elements. Is that? We'll we'll, we'll come into that. In a minute. Oh, okay. Are you are you heading that way? Yeah. Okay. All right. Go right ahead. Go right ahead. And uh, one of the big factors was that my parents were so loving. You think about it. I was 12 years old, and they bought a Hammond B organ. That was not an inexpensive thing to buy a 12-year-old kid that didn't play the organ, but I played accordion pretty good. But my parents were just such loving people. They allowed me to do what I wanted to do when it came to those kind of things. And um, the radio thing came after I was working. And you have to realize that I was uh, 
I, I only went to high school. The, the minimum days I had to be there, I'll never forget that phone call. Stan Cann, who was the organist at the Fox, he called the principal one day and he said, how many days does Heil have to be in high school? And I think it was, I don't know, 120 or whatever. And he said, okay. And we started marking them off. And I only went to school the acquired number of days to graduate in the state of Illinois in the city of Marissa a City. My, it was a village, 2,000 people, southern Illinois, because I was working. And I, I had a career when I was 14 playing in this restaurant. Uh, and, and my parents, they backed me up with anything I wanted to do. I, I, I could afford to buy a lot of this stuff. And they also would help me if I needed a little more. But it went on through craziness. Here was 1959. I was one of the first single sideband stations on six and two meters in 1957. That's a year after I got my license. I just went nuts. Now, this was 1959. That's a Johnson six and two Thunderbolt. A kilowatt point two on six and two meters, an amplifier, four CX two fifty Bs. I built it as a kit. Right beside and behind my head is a Central Electronics twenty A. You see that behind me all the time. And I learned so much from building this stuff and using this stuff. And my parents would allow me to to do this because I could afford it, because I was working. And they also would buy things for me. And uh, most of this came from Walter Ash in St. Louis. And um, in 1959, I got a call from Bob Drake, the Drake company that built the great transceivers, receivers, and amplifiers. And he said, you the guy that's got that kilowatt on two meter and six meter sideband. And I said, yes, sir. Well, they wanted to know how I learned to do that, number one, and I learned it from an incredible mentor. And that mentor, let's see, I, uh, that, I, I met this guy on six meters. I had only been on the air. Oh, gosh, I was seeing, I looked at one of the logs here just recently, and uh, <laughs> Larry, I got a hold of him about two months into my ham radio career. Now, you understand why I'm on AM with that Harvey Wells, and I heard this crazy signal. I couldn't figure it out. And the next night at 7 o'clock, here's that crazy signal again. What is that? And I turned the BFO on. I was doing everything to this receiver. I didn't know what I was doing, but every, and all of a sudden, and then I figured, he's on that new single sideband stuff. Aha. But he's on six meters. Nobody was on six meter sideband. Larry was. And so every night I met with him. And he would be playing with things and experimenting. I was 50 miles from him and on ground wave on six meters. That was really cool. And I became his little test station. And then I got to telling him about I came into St. Louis a lot because I was taking my organ lesson at the time at the Fox. He said, well, you ought to come and see me. And I said, well, I was 15. I said, my mom drives me in every Wednesday. She comes into the wholesale houses to buy goods for their clothing store that her and my dad ran in Marissa. He said, well, have her drop, us, drop you off sometime when you have some time. So I took my organ lesson. She took me down, dropped me off. We pulled in front of this building, and I look up, and it's KMOX Radio. Holy smokes. What's happening here? So I go in. I ask the reception lady for Larry Burroughs, and he come out. And it started the greatest union that I could ever imagine. And my mom would drop me off there after my lesson. I'd spend three or four hours there. And, and on the back benches of KMOX, and I know Ted's thinking about this, I am a 15-year-old kid running around the back halls of this major, major 50,000-watt CBS-owned radio station. You can't do that. Well, I did. It was, it was one of those things that couldn't be done today, but so much of my life is blessed with all of these things that just happened it just at, at the right time, I guess. And Larry taught me so much. And he taught me how to solder. He taught me about green leaf punches. Taught me how to punch a chassis, how to make this, how to do that, da-da-da. 
And I said, would you build me one of those sideband transmitters? Nope, I won't do it. But I'll teach you how. And he did. And there it is right there. <laughs> I built that 20A from a kit. And then he helped me build the mixer for it, which was a transverter. It took 20 meters, 14 megs out of there, mixed 36 meg. It was a 36 megacycle oscillator with a 6U8. What do you get? 50. You change the output coil. Uh, I, I changed a 10 meter coil to 50 megs using my mill and grid dip meter. And 50 megs, here I was. And then I needed more power, and I built that Thunderbolt, and that's how it all happened. It all started with just wonderful people that would get me under their wing. And here comes this Drake call, Mr. Drake. How can I help you? What do you need? Da -de -da. He said, well, uh, we have this thing we do with our club here in Dayton, and we'd like for you to come and talk about that. And I said, okay, I'd do that. Well, I, I got on two meters at night, started talking to some of my friends, local friends there in the southern Illinois area. And one of them had a Bonanza airplane. He says, hey, I would love to go to that. That's a symposium. A bunch of guys uh, uh, go there and, and trade ideas, and, and it's all about workshops and stuff. And he said, I'll fly you there. So we did. And that was pretty interesting, too, as a 19-year-old new ham to get in a Bonanza with a KWM-2 mounted in the panel and a, a couple of hundred feet trailing wire antenna. We worked all over the country. That was fun. Okay, we land. We go to the Biltmore Hotel. There are 600 people there. And uh, this is in 1959. It was the Dayton Hamvention. Uh, they uh, had been going about four or five years, and it was based on forums, workshops, people sharing ideas of how to build things, how to do things. And for any of the audience that were around in those days, that's what we did. And we built gear, and that was pay it, it was a time in my life that was so important because I learned how to build this stuff. While I was at that convention, I, of course, talked about the, uh, <clears throat> the station, and I had all kinds of other stations. I, the, the station kept growing, and I talked about some of that stuff. Here's this guy from the U.K. He says, um, old chap, we want to do an experiment, and you would be perfect. How would you like to do an experiment with one of our antennas? Oh, yeah, great. I'd love to do experiments. Well, he said, it's quite a massive antenna. The short story is, it was a 128-element antenna. Now, Bob? It was yeah. built by the JB Company. I've, I've got a picture. I'm going to put that same picture up right here. Let me tell you, Bob, I mean, man, you may have had some parents that really loved you to let you put that on the house. <laughs> well, luckily, there again, another blessing. We had a spare lot. <clears throat> In a, right beside our house, you can see this was a new subdivision today. My goodness, that cornfield behind me is all filled up. So, but right where this tower is was a spare lot next to our house. And it was owned by a lady that lived across the street there. She uh, owned both of those lots, and she never wanted to see anybody or anything built on it. Well, Bob, did, did, you, put that, did this, you put that up yourself? Uh, or do you have some help, uh, I, I assume, right? Oh, no. Oh, no, no, no. K9EBA, K9SGD, they're all passed on. K9EBA was a contractor, and he had cranes. And he yeah. brought in a crane, and the guys put it up. And uh, it, it was just a wonderful experience because not only did it did I t could rotate it, I could tilt it to the moon. And I was doing moon bounce in 1962. And when I think back, there wasn't much of that going on. I didn't know what I was doing. I was just having fun. And that, that was what it was all about for me was having fun. But I'm learning all this wonderful stuff. And how did I know that later on it was going to become the basis of all my careers? And, and it was just so much fun. And um, I, um, I got tired of playing. I was playing every night uh, in St. Louis. I had a pipe organ. I built a pipe organ in a restaurant there. And inter interestingly enough, I was there six nights a week, five, uh, four hours a night. 
And uh, as I would look over the music rack of the uh, pipe organ, of the theater organ, I could see the Mosley sign. Mosley's antenna plant was across the street from the restaurant. And, um, oh, they'd come over, Carl Mosley and Barney St. Grant and a lot of the people that worked there. They'd come over once in a while and eat dinner because it was a four-star restaurant I played in. Schneidhorst was the name of it. But once a month or so, I'd go in and I would get to visit their plant and see how they built things. I was there when they started building that wonderful little CM1 receiver, that guy. And I said, wow, I got to have that. So I bought that CM1. It's been with me all these years. It's a marvelous receiver. Very, very rare. They only built a thousand of them. And um, I, I, I got tired of playing six nights a week. All that good stuff. I came back to Marissa. Of course, I'd lived there. I drove back and forth every day. That was kind of a fun thing because I had mobile rigs like crazy. Uh, but it was all on six and two meters, mostly sideband. Mobile in 1959 through 65. Just all kinds of fun things. And I, I never go to Dayton that somebody doesn't come up and they'll talk about remembering those great days because they. I was their little beacon. I was on the air from 6 to 7 and from 11 to 12 every night, uh, six nights a week. So it was a great time to test your antenna <laughs> and your yeah. system. Anyway, I, got, I, I just got tired, and I, I opened this little music shop. I didn't know what I was going to do. I thought, well, I'll just open this little music store, and I'll teach organ lessons. And luckily, I got a Hammond organ franchise, and I started selling Hammond organs, and the first thing you know, I'll never forget the day this chap comes in and he had this box and he said, this is a music shop, right? And I said, yes, what can I do for you? Well, my amplifier's broke. It's broke, huh? Not broken, it was broke. Um, okay. I figured he probably made it, tried to made it go up to 10, 12 and it only went to 10, he blew it up. I turned it upside down. I didn't know what it was. I was involved in the theater organ, head over heels. I paid little to no attention to the music that was going on in the 60s. I turned it upside down. It was a fender. I, I thought that was what was on your car. <laughs> yeah. What was in that fender? A pair of 6L6s, a 5U4, and a couple of 12AX7s. Guess what, everybody? That's what's in that Harvey Wells. That mm -hmm. Harvey Wells down there. My first transmitter. It has a pair of 6L6s, a 5U4 rectifier, and a pair of 12H7s. I knew that circuit backwards and forwards. It was the modulator there. Well, hey, hams don't throw anything away. I go back into my junk box, and I had spare tubes. Replaced the screen resistors because, as you know, if you try to uh, do crazy things to a uh, 6L6, it all blow up the screen resistor and take the tube. And in about 15 minutes, I had that little fender going again. This guy was, he was just going crazy. I can't believe it. You did that without one of them schematic things. Yeah, I didn't have one of them schematic things. I didn't need it because of that. Well, the next thing you know, the whole Midwest found out about this crazy guy down in Marissa, Illinois, that could fix things. And we're talking about kids in high school still that grew up to be REO Speedwagon, Michael McDonald, Danny Fogelberg, and just a whole host of, of really great bands out of the Midwest. And they would come to Yield Music Shop, and I would help them. And I became a large dealer for Fender and Gibson. Uh, Sun, I was the largest Sun amplifier dealer in the country because those amplifiers were incredible. And um, I sold Hammond organs like crazy. Because I would sell them to the rock artist. I also rented them. The traditional Steinway piano Hammond organ store didn't even like these guys coming in. Well, hey, I did. But here's where the story got very interesting. Uh, I but hey, 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 Bob, let me let me throw in something right there because it's, it's appropriate. You got the Ye Old Music Shop, right? You, that's what uh -huh. you call it. You call it the Ye Old mu Music Shop. Uh, Today, on one of the shortwave uh, communities, a person sent me a note. His name was Bruce Bryant. He says, I remember the Ye Old Music Shop in uh, Marissa, Illinois. 
He said he bought an amplifier from you there 40 years ago, paid a, paid a better price than any music store in St. Louis. And then here's another guy in the chat room. We're just saying in 1973, he was a kid. He came and visited you there, and he said you took him around and explained a lot of things. Uh, and uh, he was just a really happy kid uh, for what you did for him there. Well, there was a lot of that. Uh, I think one of the coolest stories about the kids, and they were young kids. I mean, here's the deal. In that time, you have to kind of think about this. In that time, the traditional music shops were band instrument shops selling to school bands. They didn't want to get involved in this, well, this rock and roll stuff. And these guys would come in and their hair would be all straggly and their jeans would be cut and all that. I didn't care about that. I was really interested that I could help them. How was your hair, Bob? How was your hair, Bob? How was your hair? How was your hair? How was your hair? Was my hair? Yeah. Um, I I have a couple of pictures of that. I'll find it here. Did you Did you um, blend in with these uh, rough looking guys? Absolutely. Um, I had to. Yeah. <laughs> wow. You wouldn't I want to. You wouldn't to. want to look like a weirdo around with them, would you? No, no. I didn't have to, but I I did because. I was, I was with them all the time. Uh, my my whole life changed. My organ playing ceased, and uh, I just I just had fun. Here it is. Here it is. And this was a short hair version of that. <laughs> uh, you got some uh, Goldilocks here. Yeah. Uh huh. And my st hair still like oh, that, yeah, very yeah. curly. That was one of the first mixers I came up with, and it was one of the first modular mixers if not the first modular mixer so and so bob I here, how to do that. here you are a kid you, what age are you there and and you've got a, a bunch of famous bands now starting to come see you i know i interrupted you many guys wanted to make sure you were on the same track but all these groups are starting to come in and ask for you now right yeah well that see what happened there was i started renting the hammond organs to the promoters and uh I would go uh, take this Hammond organ up and I'd hook it all up, get it going. And we're talking about people like Janis Joplin and Jimi Hendrix and uh, fabulous bands. Uh, and I didn't know that music, but I became very aware really quick because I could see they needed help. My gosh, hook! They, they, I'd come in and have that organ hooked up in no time and they'd still be piddling around for hours because – they really didn't know what to do. They knew what they wanted, but they didn't know how to achieve it. And a lot of the times I'd end up helping their uh, uh, their technicians hook things up. Well, the next thing you know, I'd go into these big arenas. We'd rent a Keel Auditorium in St. Louis. I think it was 18,000, 19,000 seats. And they had these little bitty columns. That was the deal. Those things were put in there in probably 19, I don't know, 45. And they would try to fill this big arena with these little speakers, and it was awful. It was terrible because the guitar amps would just blow it away. You could never hear the vocals. Another time, of, as I said, I was just so blessed by all this stuff that would happen in my life. Along about, uh, this would have been 68, I, uh, I thought, I'm going to see my, my old buddies at the Fox. I rolled through the uh, parking lot or the alleyway of the Fox Theater. Hadn't been there in a few years. And um, I go in and what's out in the alley are these big boxes. I'm going, what's going on here? I go in, George Bales, who used to bring me the organ up and down out of the pit when I played a few years ago. I said, George, what are you doing? He said, we're putting in a new sound system. I said, really? What are you doing with all that outside? He said, well, those are all uh, Altec uh, uh, A4s. Really? Well, are these the new ones? No, no, no. We're throwing those away. Oh, well, wait a minute. You are throwing Altec A4s away? Yeah. I said, well, can I have them? Sure. You got a truck? I said, I'll go get one. And I did. There was the A4s. I took them home. We rebuilt them by putting new speakers in them. I built some mid-range horns out of fiberglass. I had a friend that was in the fiberglass boat business. We, had, we put uh, JBL tweeters on the top. And this was a four-way system. Nobody had ever done this. I, and this is 
this is way ahead of its time. This is 1968. And the promoters are going nuts. Now everybody's calling me. And I... I would go bring the sound system. I had a couple of roadies from Carbondale, Illinois that I uh, had working. They were just great. Those kids knew every lick of music, and we were just building systems like crazy. And uh, one day the promoter said to me, uh, hey, how about you uh, take a little road trip with that thing? He said, I got a group in Ohio, and I'd love for you to, to do their sound. Uh, we got a little little road trip coming up, little tour. Okay. And this is that group. How many people know what that group is? It's Joe Walsh. Is that the James the Gang? James. Yes. And now I'm out there for about two weeks. My two roadies and myself getting it going. Everything was going good. I had no idea. One day, I don't know. I, I, I try to remember how that conversation went, but Joe and I figured out we were both ham radio operators. That day changed a lot of things for a lot of people because Joe then became involved in my experiments, and that's really what they were. He, was, he, wa- he always wanted to do these things, but the – the people we worked with, the sound guys, they didn't know what to do. They'd bring in with these little columns. We were building a lot of different things. Here's one that was built with very easy to carry around. Had a whole bunch of phase linears, and it had a crown in the middle of it, which has a very special story about that. I'll come back to that. But Joe and I became very, very good friends off stage. And it was great because during the performance, Joe would say, he'd come over to me because I, I would mix from the stage and he'd say, hey, let's try this, do that. I mean, he's playing Walk Away or something and he had this idea and he knew if he came to me and hit me with that idea, we could try out during the show. <laughs> it was a great union of a pair of amateur radio operators that had soldering irons and kind of knew what to do with them. And we were both in our world, let me tell you. And that's how a lot of this started. And uh, one day, I get this call uh, from a guy. Who is the guy? It was George Bales. He said, hey, you still got that big PA that that you got from me? And I said, yeah. He said, "Uh, does it work? And I said, well, yeah, I got Macintosh amps on it. We uh, got a a really neat uh, Longevin mixing console for it. We talked to this guy. This band showed up tonight, and their PA didn't make it. Oh, okay. He hands the phone on the stage of my beloved Fox Theater to Joe Walsh. I mean, to Jerry Garcia. I'm all right looking at Joe's picture. Jerry Garcia of the Grateful Dead. He was at the Fox, and he didn't have a PA system. And I told him what I had, and he said, well, does, does this all work? And I said, yes, sir, it works great. And uh, that was the system. And uh, I said, what's the problem? He said, well, the problem is the uh, FBI and the drug agents uh, confiscated our sound man and our PA last night after the concert in New Orleans, and we came on to St. Louis of course, in 1970, you didn't have cell phones. They come on to St. Louis, they get on the stage at 4 o'clock, and there's no equipment. So we uh, <laughs> got busy real quick and got up to the theater about 8 o'clock, and by about 9 o'clock, we were going. And it changed the rock and roll world because that night was magic for them, for me, for all of rock and roll sound. And there's an article, and anybody that would like to really know the rest of the story, all you got to do is put the night rock and roll sound was born. Put that into Google. The night rock and roll sound was born. I didn't know the guy that wrote the article. It was absolutely 100% true. He had to have been there. Every little nuance of that story was right. We hit the front page of Billboard magazine. At this little store in Marissa, Illinois, 
got the Grateful Dead touring contract because they didn't they didn't have a sound system, and uh, we were on the road. Now, luckily for me, remember those two uh, roadies I talked about? They were Grateful Deadheads. They knew every lick. Well, that was a big deal. Again, another blessing laid. They knew every song. They knew every beat, and they could mix. And, of course, mixing the band, you have to know their music to really mix them well. And uh, off we went. They went. I didn't go with them because I had other things going on, but we did the tour. They did the tour. A couple of days after they were on tour, I get this call from Jerry, from Garcia. He said, hey, what is this on all your amplifiers and stuff? It says, ye old music shop. What's going on with that? I said, well, that's the name of my store, and I just put it on the speakers. He said, man, we have trouble saying all that yield. We're just going to call you Heil Sound. Is that okay? And so it was. The history and the truth, Jerry Garcia named Heil Sound. I know a lot of people say, well, that's your last name. That was he. No, no, no. The company at the time was Yield Music Shop. We became very good friends. And what was very cool about all of this, Tom, I have never to this day tasted beer. I have never tasted beer. Uh, tasted beer. I have never smoked a cigarette. Of course, never done any drugs. I was around a lot of it. But that was their deal. If they wanted to do it, beautiful. I'd, I don't care. And so here I was in all of this. And what was so great about it is when they would come to me and they would come to Marissa all so many of these artists they would come to Marissa just to be in ye old music shop and see all of this we had then built a huge 7,000 square foot building that we were building amplifiers and speakers and stuff and we did the tours out of there we'd set them up and rehearse and do the whole thing out of Marissa we were the first guys to put uh a whole tour together. We did trucking for lighting. We did trucking for the guitar amps. We did sound and all that in a 40-foot semi. That Nobody was doing that in the late 60s. I got an old bus, and we uh, we took all the seats out. And, and, and It was an old Greyhound, but we restored it all, and it could sleep 11 people. That way, we didn't have that expense. And But, Bob, I heard, they, could, I heard they wanted you to be the bus driver. Yeah, right. <laughs> no, we hired a, a legitimate licensed driver uh, that had worked for Greyhound because we this was this was big deal. We had a lot of a lot of stars and artists and a lot of their engineers, and this had to be the real deal, and it was. Uh, so we started all that early. It was I think back on it, and it's just it's a miracle of how how it all came together. But again, it was all blessings and. Uh, from that article that appeared on the front page of Billboard, things got real crazy. I was getting calls from all kinds of people and all kinds of things like these big rock festivals. We did several of these, uh, 100,000 kids, 50,000, 20,000, because we had the sound system to do it. We just kept building and building. We had three of those road systems that you saw a minute ago. And while we would build them, we'd build them so they could hook on to each other. And uh, when we'd be called upon these huge events, we could hook them all together. And, oh, my gosh, it was so good. And it wasn't it, – it, it was – my one of my great organ teachers was George Wright. He was the prolific – Wurlitzer Theater concert guy, I mesmerized George. He was incredible. It's how I learned to play, by listening to his records years ago. George, uh, in a few lessons I got to take from George, he said, I'm going to teach you how to play this organ. And I'm going to teach you a little differently. Most people just want to play it loud. You put down all the stops and bingo. I'm going to teach you how to play it good and loud. And I never forgot that because it carried me through my organ career too because I do play pretty good and I do play loud. <laughs> and I always listened to that 
in my head when I was building this stuff. And it's why even today, if I will see Pete Townsend or I will see Joe Walsh or Peter Frampton or Jay Giles or whoever, I was with Randy Bachman of Bachman Turner a few months ago. And the first thing they say is, gosh, I wish we had your big sound system back because the stuff today doesn't sound really good. It's loud, but it doesn't sound good. It, it, our stuff was a big hi-fi system. And, and I was taught by a guy, and this was another blessing. I got a call in 1970, right after that Grateful Dead thing and and, and the article on Billboard. I get this call, and, and the phone rings. I pick it up, and I say, hello. And, and before I could even start talking, the guy said, that you, Heil? And I said, yes, sir. Who's this? That's the Clips here. I'm going, Clips? Paul Clips? Yeah. He says, you the guy that's got that 20,000-watt PA? And I said, yes, sir. He said, I'll come and see it. He was a crusty old guy, but oh, my God, was he a genius. He was the father of the folded horn. He was the father of the hi-fi movement. And he flew up to see me. He wanted to see a 20,000-watt PA. Who, what, in his, who, what person in his right mind would waste that much power? Because he was an efficiency nut. And I knew that. I knew his history. And uh, all day, he didn't cut me down. It just, why you do this? Why you do that? Why you do that? And then he put me in his plane, took me back down to Hope, Arkansas that night. And we spent the next day there. And I say this very meaningful, um, kind of humorous, but I couldn't be more serious. It was like a drunk meeting Jesus. He taught me more things that I was doing wrong in those few days. And then we became very good friends. And when we would do a lot of these, you can't see it much here, but there's some speakers way out in the, in the midst here uh, that I went back down to Hope, Arkansas, and he, he would build special cabinets for us. And then we got to building our own cabinets and doing our own things, and he would guide me through that. And help me. How do you tune a speaker to a resonant cavity? How do you do so much? And he would teach me. And it, oh, it was amazing. And Paul Klipsch was a wonderful, wonderful guy. If you don't know who he is, go spend some time on Google and find out. He was an amazing guy. And the, probably one of the best things he taught me, because he was impressed that I could listen. But he also was a pipe organ fanatic because of the harmonics of the pipe organ. He knew all about the word, sir. But he taught me about the Fletcher Munson curve. And I will ask people in a lot of workshops I do, how many people know who Dr. Fletcher and Dr. Munson were? And very few do. And it should be the second question on our amateur radio license. You get me going on this, Tom, and I could just go crazy because they're teaching us the wrong things. I don't want to hear about your political nonsense. I don't want to have all your nonsense that you teach on these tests today. I want to know about phasing. I want to know about what happens with frequency response. What happens when we're listening? How do our ears work? Dr. Fletcher, Dr. Munson, well... The telephone company had them in 19, around 31 or 2. The telephone system didn't work very well. It was awful, and they couldn't figure it out. All the voltages were right. All of the frequencies were right. What's the deal? Dr. Fletcher and Dr. Munson found out. The Fletcher-Munson curve. And if you don't know about it, please do me, no, do you a favor. Look it up, and you're going to find out that your ears are not anywhere close to flat. Look at this. Huge hole in it. The sensitivity is a whole different ball game. And you notice up here at 120 decibel, it's almost flat. It's why the kids like to listen to their music loud because we hear all the cymbals, we hear all the vocals, we hear all the bass. But when we listen to it lower level, look what happens. Half of it goes away. Fletzer Munson curve. What good does that do me? Why as a ham radio operator, why do I need to know that? You need to know it because that's what you're listening out of that receiver. And every one of these receivers are terrible. 
Yes, the $15,000 ones, the $6,000 one, the $200 one, they're all the same. They got a one-watt chip at 10% distortion. They put it in a 50-cent 50, 50 speaker, put it in a $100 box, paint it the same color. They've been fooling you for years. It's a matching speaker. It's a matching microphone. They don't have a clue. They don't build either one of those. And it really it just it just invigorates me, and I get so ticked off when I see this happen because nobody's talking about it. Well, I do. And what you see behind me, not one of all of these things, and there's six high-dollar transceivers in here, not a one of them do I listen to their audio because it's terrible. I come out of the product detector. Every one has got a line out in the back. you got to go get it. It's in their little accessory plug. You come into, I bring it into a 12-channel mixer. If I want to change the level of something, I don't do it on the receiver. I do it here. That's the 7800. That's the 7600. I switch the antenna first. But it, it goes out of that mixer, and it goes into a little wonderful, wonderful JBL studio monitor called Control 2P. has a pair of 35-watt amplifiers at point. 1% distortion. And you just can't imagine what it makes to do that. What the difference is. In fact, I got a letter. I got a letter uh, just a couple of days ago from Michael, KT5MR, telling me all about, wow, I did what you said and I can't believe what I've been missing. And uh, it was really cool because most of these people don't understand articulation. They don't understand distortion. They see the figures. They don't do anything about it because what can you do with that thing? Well, you can do a lot. And guess what those JBL speakers cost, Tom? They cost 150 bucks for a pair of them. Two 35-watt amps, a tweeter, a woofer, all tuned to that cabinet. We use them in the million-dollar studios. I'm sure that Ted might have some down in his studio for near-field monitors. In a big studio, you have all the big thousands and thousands of dollars of your monitors up on the ceiling pipe. But we need headphones. Well, we can't use headphones when we're mixing or in a way, so we take near-field monitors, very high-quality speakers, and you put them about right here. And that's that's what we're using here. That's what and I've had a lot of guys get hip to this and I love it when I get letters like that back saying, hmm, you were right. So it, it's it's just a whole culmination of things that I I've I've been blessed to be able to play with all my life and it came with the with the theater organ, learning to listen. And then, of course, being able to be on the road with all these spectacular bands. After that article appeared, I was just getting all kinds of calls. One of them I got one day. We were out on the road with Chaka Khan because she was using my talk box. I forgot to talk about the talk box. One of, I guess, what I'm known for in the music industry big time is uh, Joe and I, he came up with a song called Rocky Mountain Way, and we were putting together Barnstorm. All the equipment for it. It's in 1972. And he had done the album down in Memphis with a little speaker and a funnel thing. And uh, uh, he said, we got to do this live. How are we going to do it? And so we went out to our plant. He and Joe and I one uh, Sunday afternoon and got a 250-watt JBL driver. We built low-pass, high-pass filter. Bingo. Talk box. I built it for Joe. A lot of stuff I do. I built it for Joe. I didn't look beyond Joe. Well, it became pretty popular after that song became popular. And then <laughs> a gal, her name was Penny. She was running around with Humble Pie. And their lead guitarist, we did every concert Humble Pie did just about in their whole career. Um, <laughs> Penny was married in our home. A lot of that happened where they'd come over here from the from England and they only had a six month green card. But if they got married, they could stay here and become a citizen. Well, what happened to that deal? I mean, we won't get into politics, but. <laughs> 
and she needed a Christmas present for Peter. So I sent her a talk box for her new love of her life, Peter Frampton. And just the other day, I ran across the paperwork where I sent it to her, and she gave it to Peter. And there's a really great video on our website. I go digging around some of the videos that Peter and I did in Nashville here a few years ago. We sat down and talked about it. And he'll tell you that that talk box kind of made his career. Not that he couldn't play before it, but really kind of was a signature of, of Peter and Joe and a whole bunch of other people. But it was all because of what I did for Joe, not thinking beyond Joe. Same thing happened with the microphones, and we'll get back into that a little bit. But uh, I get this call from the Who, and they said, uh, well, we're in trouble. We're in New York, and we got this new tour, and our sound system is just nothing. We came over here with little columns, and it's not big enough. And I said, well, I can't be there. We're in, in Chicago with Chaka. She's using our talk box, and we got a big hit right now. And uh, he said, I don't care what it takes. I said, well, we can't be in Boston tomorrow. You, well, you got to be there tomorrow. I, we can't do that. He said, rent an airplane and fly here. <laughs> so I found a Chicago sound system guy that I knew, and he covered the Chaka tour. We rented a Tiger Freight Air Jet at 707. First time I, probably the last time I ever leased or rented a 707. And uh, flew that system out and changed the whole world because the Who in those days were flying high and the sound was part of it. The sound was all of this great Heil sound system they had. And uh, in 73, after that tour, I got a call from Peter and he said, hey, come over here, I want to talk to you. So I go over to England, sat down in a wonderful, wonderful studio that he had doing all the great work. And he said, hey, quad sound is big right now. Can, this is 1973. He said, could you build the sound system so we can move Roger's voice around the hall? I told you a while ago, no, it was not in my vocabulary. So I said, okay. And so we did. And as I left, I, I'll never forget this one. As I left his house that day, giving the big hug and all of that, he said, he looked at me, he said, Bob, you go build it. I'll go finish writing it. It was kind of cool because... He could finish writing it knowing that we were going to have this sound system, and we did. Quadrophenia, and those are some of the pieces that are in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. It's why we're there. There were several other companies doing sound in those days, but not innovative stuff. We were doing crazy stuff. Because of my knowledge of phasing with antennas and ham radio, I was the first guy to come up with monitors. That was very important. Because if you put a microphone in front of that, what would happen? It would feed back. Why didn't it feed back? Because I would take the monitor board. We had a separate monitor console. Wire it out of phase. Where did I learn that? Antennas. In and out of phase. How does your Yagi work? How do you get a reflector to keep things away from the back and directors direct them to the front? Some are in phase, some aren't. I learned it from antennas, from that big antenna. That 128-element antenna was my college professor. I learned so much from that, and I applied that to the monitors. And Heil Sound became very popular on the touring market because we could put speakers not only on the floor, but we would put the monster stuff beside them and shoot it across the front of the stage. Nobody was doing that. And so it was just, I didn't know. I just was having fun. <laughs> but I, uh, I i got out of all that in 1978 and came back to ham radio. And I also got involved in the satellite business. I was, 1989, I was a satellite dealer of America. I was really into the home, the, uh, home theater and home satellite Nobody was doing it, and we started in 1980, 81, and we put in thousands of these things and taught a lot of dealers, a lot of television dealers, how to do the satellite things. And that picture was taken in 1985. Along with all that, we were building 
home theaters. I mean, we were audio guys, and we were kind of the first guys to put it together. We're talking about the real deal. This is Ozzie Smith's basement in 1991, uh, the baseball player in St. Louis. We did a lot of theaters. I did a lot of stuff. Had a guy one time come to me and said, hey, I got this old house, and I got this room in the basement. Um, can you do something with this room? And Like, is there a possibility? Of course, I had all kinds of subcontractors. We turned that room that you're looking at into this room. And that's, that's what we did. Hundreds of these things. And uh, a lot of high-dollar homes and stuff. And it was so much fun. But then when I got that award at that time when I received it at a convention, Stanley Hubbard came to me and he said, Hey, I want to hire you. You seem like a guy that could help us. I'm looking for some guys that could be our beta testers. And I said, well, what are we testing? He said, well, I bought a license in 1985. I paid $60 million for it. And this was 1990. Now, he said, I haven't done anything with it, but we've been working on it. It's the first K-band. It was four times the frequency of the big stuff. The big 12-foot, 10-foot dishes were four gigs. If you go to 12 gigs, guess what? The antenna can be four times smaller. I was on the test team for what became Direct TV. That was 1991. And in a newspaper article down at the bottom, I said there, I just had a guy the other day said, hey, I saw a statement you made back in the 90s that a lot of people were going to be watching TV with little dishes. And I was uh, about eight years ahead on that one. <laughs> what drives it all? Ham radio. I got back into ham radio. I turned on my radio and I heard the most atrocious stuff. Oh my God, what was all this? I couldn't understand it. Because in the 12 years I was off the air, the imports came in. The Collins, the Drakes, all of that was kind of mm, articulation was gone. And uh, it was all the things that didn't work very well. MC50s and Yesu and Kenwood and things I never heard of, but the audio was sucky. It was terrible. And I'm like, oh, he sounds really good. No, he didn't. Didn't have any articulation. And and so I got to working on that. And here we are, what, how many years later? I started in 1982. And we brought some very, very interesting and needed things to amateur radio in, in the form of good articulation and understanding the spoken word it's it's been a really remarkable run and about eight years ago joe said to me he said hey come here i was sitting in his kitchen one day he says you gotta do something with this i said what am i gonna do with that well it's not good i said well everybody uses it i don't care it's not very good your ham radio microphone sounds better. I oh, Joe Walsh, get that guy. He takes me down in his studio, and he hooks it up. And I will do the same. This is an SM58. And you got to be right here. Don't move off, because if you move off, you lost everything. You already lost half of it anyway, because it's very low in gain. we got to do a lot of stuff with it. But he said it doesn't sound very good. It doesn't sound like your ham radio microphone. I said, Joe, what are you talking about? It, it's it's an SM58. I know that. So he pulls out the gold mine and listen to the difference. And it, I'm not changing anything. All I'm doing is unplugging one microphone and going to another. And, and it's remarkable uh, when you think about it why some of those things still exist. And it's all about ego and habit. Use it all these years. I'm as well. It's great. No, it's not. It's 45-year-old technology, and it was Joe Walsh and I, two grazing hams, that came up with different technologies. And it was really cool to have the eagles as your beta tester. I guess that's the best part of it. We have our own pattern where I can move a full 180 degrees, and it still stays with me. And because of that phasing, we get an incredible rear rejection of about 40 dB. How do you do that? You do it with phasing. And none of these companies are doing anything. They're just building the same old stuff. And the same thing with all the RE20s and stuff. Like, what's the big deal? Well, big deal is habit and ego. 
There's the big RE20. And what's so exciting about this? Nothing. Rush Limbaugh uses it, but don't move off. Because if you do, you're gone. It has no rear rejection of any account. And uh, I even make it uh, even crazier. This is our PR781. It outperforms a, an RE20. You can move around on it. It's got this great rejection. 40 dB a rear. And this is all because Joe's idea. He wanted me to do this, and I did it for him. Never thinking beyond. Well, here we are with hundreds of leading uh, Grammy artists and all of these wonderful bands and artists and recording engineers. It's nine and, and broadcast stations are using our stuff from Carrie Underwood to Stevie Wonder. So that's it, it's just remarkable, Tom, that, it, that it's all because of amateur radio. And it's why I had a guy here today he said, man, where do you get the time? I said, I take the time. I have to give this back because of what ham radio gave to me in the beginning. And it still does. I learn things every day. So that's pretty much what's going on in my uh, my little humble life here of uh, radios and soldering irons and microphones. <laughs> Bob, that's a, uh, man, that is a, an, an amazing story. Uh, it, it's just hard for me to uh, grasp everything you said. I mean, what a life you've had, man. Can and, I, can I and, get in here just for a go second? Go ahead, Ted. I was in Las Hi, Vegas, Ted. Nevada. Hi there. In Las Vegas, and um, Bob was there getting ready to do a presentation to the local ham group, but it was his typical audio seminar that he does. And um, I saw the RE20 <clears throat> sitting there, and I thought, what in the world is he doing with that? That's a broadcast microphone. <laughs> so anyhow, he proceeded with the presentation, and he, um, he brought the mic out and plugged it in and talked into it. And I thought, that's really pitiful. <laughs> you know? And then in the back of my mind, I'm wondering, is there something wrong with that microphone? You know. So anyhow, time had passed, and, and Bob was in Nashville doing the same presentation at a music store. And I, I, I went in, and I took my son with me, Matt, who is who's Dave Ramsey's chief engineer, and he's dealing with audio all the time. He sees the RE20 sitting there, and he says, uh, what, what's he got an RE20? I said, test this. I said, go back and forth between these mics. And I think Matt was testing a PR30, and then he went to the, P, uh, then he went to the RE20. <laughs> he said, and Bob was across the room. I'll never forget this. Matt said, did he drop this thing? And Bob looked over like, "What are you talking about?" You know, and so, you know, it was it was a kind of a forgotten subject until I got the first PR40. And Bob had shipped a PR40 to me, and believe it or not, I had just purchased like three, no, four RE20s. And uh, I went in the studio and I plugged the uh, the PR40 in and I talked in the in the mind. Wow, I said this thing sounds cool, and and I and I disconnected it and i put the re20 on and it sounded like it had a cold you know had a deep sinus infection <laughs> and so i said what have i done i own four of these things now you know and i was really sick over it so i guess my only point is this and that is i kind of like to blow the whistle here or blow the trumpet that's a better thing for bob because the the, the pr30 and the PR40 are revolutionary microphones. And in the broadcast business, which I'm a broadcast engineer, every station I go into, I try to replace everything in the house with PR30s and PR40s. And uh, I walked into our studio uh, in Nashville, and the young man was on the air, and he had his RE27N, which is, I don't know. I don't want to make any comments there. That thing, <laughs> it's definitely not my cup of tea. Uh I walked over and I says, can I swap your mic out for just a little bit here? And uh, his name was, was Scotty O'Brien. He said, sure, go ahead. And I, I switched it out and uh, went about my business. And he used the microphone for a little while. And uh, I had finished up the work I was doing. And I said, well, I got to go. So I went back in the studio. And he says, you're not taking this microphone. <laughs> I said, I have to. I got to go. Oh, no, no, no. You are not taking this microphone. So I left without the mic. He had the mic on the air. He loved that microphone. So 
I can verify and say from a broadcast engineer standpoint, and I've been doing broadcast engineering for about 40 years, uh, the Heil microphones inside of a radio station are magic. And what they've done for amateur radio is the same thing. And that is, Bob is right, audio has changed on ham radio. Uh, and it's because of the fact that, you know, there's somebody listening you know, and knowing how to uh, design these things. But I just wanted to jump in real quick and tell this story because I wanted to verify the fact that from the broadcasting standpoint, um, everything that he's saying is absolutely beyond a shadow of a doubt the truth. And it, uh, I think it's really changed the sound of radio. Well, it, it most uh, surely has. And uh, I've noticed that with the high mics that uh, I've... Uh uh, acquired over the years. They really, really sound good. I think Bob is uh, looking for something there to show us, uh, probably. Yeah. Uh, hey, Bob, there was yeah, a question. Thanks. There was a question in the chat room uh, uh, about uh, you stopped touring or something. I mean, you're still traveling with these, some of these groups, aren't you? Yeah, I don't have to drive the truck anymore. Yeah. <laughs> no, I... Uh, I my whole deal is now I I sold all of the equipment in 1980. I just got tired of touring and traveling. Music changed. Punk rock came in. Sound was not anything. When when the Who and Walsh and Frampton and and all of these great groups I worked with, there's so many of them. They were very excited and interested in getting great mixes. They're, they were more than just a loud rock and roll band. And I think that was one of the things that uh, that led them to me because I didn't put them down. A lot of other people that didn't understand their music would say, oh, you know, one day you want it loud and one day you want it distorted. And one, Well, yeah, that all goes with it. Some songs is this way, some that way. I understood that. As, a, as an artist myself, as an organist, I have all these different sounds and things that happen when you're playing a, a huge theater organ with all of these many, many stops. There's 250-some stops in this thing. And and you ha you are the orchestra leader. Pete Townsend, the orchestra leader, but he doesn't have violins and banjos and fiddles and uh, oboes and stuff. He has guitars and bass guitar and a wonderful drummer. And I was the guy that helped him bring out that ambience that they wanted. And and I think that was a big part of it. That, that, but I got tired of when the punk rock came in. They didn't care. They just wanted it bashing loud, and. The, all the good stuff that I was working with, all of my artists were off the road. If you think back in the 80s, late 70s, 80s, music kind of took a dive, the record industry and everything. And so I sold my rig and I got into ham radio again, and, and I'm thankful I did. But one of the things, and I, I, I need to mention this, that changed amateur radio, and it really did. It was a historic change. When I came back on the scene, I, as I said, all these radios sounded awful. They were mushy. They were bassy. You couldn't understand what they were saying. Here, I'll give you a very good demonstration of that. Most of what I was hearing sounded like this. And I went, what, what happened? What happened to Art Collins, Bob Drake, and all these wonderful articulate audio guys? Well, what happened was... They forgot about one thing, and that was speech articulation, and you notice how I brought it all back to life. How did I do that? I built, the first thing I did, I built this. And in the, in the realms when I'm long, long gone, this will go in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame of amateur radio. It was the equalizer, the EQ200. EQ 300. It was a simple little two-band equalizer. I just demonstrated it for you. We were then able to adjust our matching, that means painted the same color, microphones so we could understand each other. And we built thousands of these. I reopened the Heil Sound plant 
and got back into business because at that time I'd closed it and I got back into the business building those little equalizers and I uh, then figured out wait a minute we can do this in the microphones and then we we tailored the hc4s the hc5s because there was no adjustment on the radio nothing just mic gain so we did it by selecting the kind of elements that we built today whole different world we're building pretty much full range elements across all of the things we do and you get to be the engineer you are the guy that, that's adjust all of your equalization the way you want to hear it and so that all come about and the really interesting part is dr in who owns icom uh, he called me first oh it's been 10 years ago said he was working on a new project he wanted to know more about he sent me a picture of himself with one of my gold lines and an eq 200 in his station this is the president of icom now, Bob, aren't you, uh, don't the large manufacturers have you looking at their audio circuits and all the major radios now? Or you're involved some way well, that, with them. That, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. Dr. Inouye, who owns ICOM, Inouye Communications, ICOM, he had this, he figured out how good this was, and he was working on this new series of radios, and we helped them develop the two-band EQ, and it's in all the pros all the way through the 76, 77, 7800. That's all the same equalizer. Then Dr. Hasegawa that owns Yesu, ah, oh, I want to do it better. So we did a parametric for them, and it's in all of the radios from 9,000 all the way down through the 1,200. So we did have an impact on this entire business uh, because we were the guys that helped them put equalizers in. Not that they couldn't have done it themselves, but I already had it going. Hello? And so they didn't have to do anything. They just had to come to me because those are different filters that you have for a hi-fi system. I get a kick out of these guys. Oh, I got this 38 band or whatever. Equalizer radio shack for my hi-fi. It'll work. No, it won't because the filters are on their own frequency. We only have two and a half to three K wide and you have to have these filters just where you need them to get the articulation value. But anyway, that's that's how that all started. And we're very blessed that that, that it happened because it changed all of amateur radio. We're still out on the road. Somebody asked that question. Yeah. But now I just go out and help people like Keith Urban Charlie Daniels, you got 35 PR35s with him. Stevie Wonder. I mean, they'll call me in to help if they have a problem. And my girlfriend, oh boy, Carrie Underwood is something. She's just so great. She's been using PR35s for probably eight, nine years. And my good old buddy, Paul Rogers. He was the guy that I did the PR22 for. He said, I want a microphone that's got a lot of articulation, and I don't want to have to, my sound man do it because he doesn't know what I want. So we built a PR-22 with some extended mid-range articulation, and that's my favorite microphone for ham radio because it's got that really great articulation, but it's great for live too. And then there's this guy. You'll recognize him from the hat, <laughs> Slash. Mm -hmm. and, and it's very interesting because of my lifestyle and whatever – I, these guys are friends. They have to be my friend first or I won't work for them because we have to be on the same page. Right? I, 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 you know, We all know and respect each other to what we can do and what we can't do. And It's just been a marvelous, marvelous life to be able to, to, to help these guys. And, and that's, that's the whole deal is that everybody that tries to help them either wants to be their groupie or uh, give me some free tickets. Well, no. What about bringing your soldering iron and making something happen? <laughs> and that's what we do, Tom. There's, a, there's a, a question here for you. What's the difference between a PR-10 and a PR-40? A PR-10 and a PR-40, about uh, two octaves. <laughs> okay. A PR-40 gets down to 28 cycles, and I, I truly believe there's no other microphone that will do that in the dynamic uh, school it's a it's a marvelous full range but yet it has that learned it from paul klipsch from fletcher munson curve from about two and a half k out to about three and a half k he's got that nice mid-range 
and so you get great articulation without a lot of equalization. But uh, when you put that PR40 in a ham radio, you got to do some things. You are really jamming some low end into the uh, preamp of your transmitter, and you need to roll that off because you're you're going to get really mushy then. PR10, I've already done that for you, and uh, PR10 is really a PR a baby PR781. Same thing here that you're listening to here. There's no EQ on this thing, and it sounds really, really good. It's articulate, and uh, it's become a very popular microphone. And we built the PR10 with that cool little bass. That's, that bass is really slick. Hey, you had mentioned uh, Russ Limbaugh earlier. Somebody said he had a gold mic or something. Uh, anything special yeah, about that mic? No. <laughs> <laughs> no. Hey, I like it. I like that one. Thing, by the way. This, this is a very cool deal. This is our first product that we built on a 3D printer. We did all the tooling and all the design. We changed it three or four times. And um, it even lights up when you push the push to talk switch. <laughs> uh, this is a great product. Uh, we've got a new base, and that, that also comes with the PR-10. Hey, I, I just uh, want to say one thing real quick here while I got Bob. Where, so I don't forget this. Bob has been a great supporter of our webcast over the years. And we have given away... Heil microphones, Heil headsets, Heil foot switches. I'm trying to think of all the things we've given away, Bob. I, I can't think of all, but uh, it's really been some nice prizes that uh, have gone out with your name on them. Well, I, I like to support people that support this hobby because we need it, Tom. We need programs like this, and this is unusual. Most of my programs, we get into fixing stuff making things work and helping people and how do you hook this up and how do you do that i love workshops i do oh four or five clubs a, a week i'm going to do one again here uh next tuesday uh, uh, down in texas we we do clubs via skype and there yeah, there are workshops uh, my history's out there just put bob heil rock hall into google and you'll learn more than you want, <laughs> want to know <laughs> in a dvd thing it's up there on youtube just um, Bob Heil Rock Hall. And, and there's all kinds of stuff like that article I told you about. There's a lot of things. But uh, they all know that part. But I love to come into the clubs and help them. We need more Elmering right here in Springfield, Missouri. I do a radio show each Saturday morning. A guy has a, a security show, and it's all about uh, guns and safety. And he has me on for a half an hour. Uh, we've been doing this since last fall, and we talk about ham radio. And uh, my wife, Sarah, she owns Heil Sound today, Lock, Stock, Barrel. I just invent stuff here in my station lab, and this really is more than a ham radio station. It's a laboratory. And uh, she runs the plant, her, Stephen, Jerry, Donna. Donna's been with us 22 years, but Sarah's a incredible business lady and she keeps it all going back in illinois and she'll be over here thursday and then she'll be here for a couple of weeks and i just came back from there i was there for a week we're back and forth a lot it's only three hours or so but the deal there is that we we love to take care of our of our customers we're, we're hands-on people and that's something that a lot of the a lot of the people don't, and one of the things that Sarah did, she worked out a deal with R&L where listeners of this gun show, and really anybody, can go to their website and put in the search box, New Ham, and they get a handy talkie and one of Gordon's and West books for 50 bucks postpaid. We have now, you ready for this, Tom, since mm -hmm. last October... We have over 110 people in Springfield, Missouri, that have bought that package, have the handy talkies, have the book. And I just heard from uh, Joey. He was here a while ago. He's one of the guys that's, ta that's taught the classes and stuff. We have over 52 new hams in Springfield. Wow. Now, think. Yeah. But you know what's wrong? They don't have any Elmering. And that's what we're working on. The clubs can give the tests. They get you all juiced up to this hobby. And you go and you take the test. And then, okay, see you on the air, bye. And you go home and go, what in the world do I do now? 
And that is where we are. This hobby is stymied, stopped. It's brick-walled because we don't have people doing Elmering. I had so many. Larry Burroughs, the chief engineer at KMOX, with the best one for me. I mean, he was so good for me. And K0RIR. And I just start a whole list. I keep, it's kind of faded, but I keep Larry's QSL card with me all the time. He meant so much to me. And Larry Burroughs meant something to you if you get any of my products and mm -hmm. think about how good they are and you like them. That's the guy that got me started in this whole thing. We need Elmering. And I, I don't know what to do about it. We had quite a conversation today about it. And uh, and it's all over. It's not just Springfield, Missouri, but this is a case in point. Here we are. I created it. Sarah created it, getting uh, this thing together. What do we do? How, how are we going to bring these guys on into the hobby? I think the first thing they should do is get their general license so they can get on, on the low frequencies and get into real-time radio talking all over the world. You don't have to have a big tower. I pulled off a thing. You might have seen it on Ham Nation um, about a year ago. Oh, it was a year ago because I told Roger at Arnell, I said, hey, Find me a radio at Dayton. I never get to go out on the parking lot. Uh, I, I don't ever get from out behind my booth hardly. But um, I said, find me a radio. If I want to spend 150 bucks, and I want it to work. I don't care what it is. And he, he at the end of the show on Sunday, he brought me, he brought me a, a, an IC730, an old 730, one of the early ICOMs that didn't even have a mic preamp in it. The mic preamp was built in the microphone. It was an atrocious sounding thing, but it worked. 150 bucks, I paid him. And I did a show. You can go find it on Ham Nation about a year or so ago. I went out here and I showed you how I took two 33-foot pieces of wire, tied it on the end of a piece of coax, put it out here in a cherry tree. It's 15 foot high. Came in here, pressed the mic button, called CQ. The first station that came back to me was London, England. Now, let me tell you something. If you're not a ham and you just got your license... And you get your first radio, and you go out here and string up an antenna 15 foot high, and you talk to London. If you're not excited, then I'm, I don't know. We, I don't know what we can do with you. Even for yeah. me, it's exciting. It gets so excited. Last night was incredible. I'm gonna be there again tonight, man. Working the pileups or ham nation. I've never heard such pileups, and we're so gracious for all of this. But. Main thing is I like to bring things back and give it back to the hobby because they've done so much for me. And that's why Sarah and I support you and Kathy because you also have done so much to keep people abreast and, and teach them things. And that's what I think that's our that's our, our, our main goal in life that, that we're doing now, Tom, is to help people learn more about this great hobby. Can I get in here just for a second, Bob? Go ahead. Sure. Go ahead, Tim. Yeah. Okay. Why don't you tell the story of Bill Decker? Well, you're talking about Elmering and people who take a group of hams, you know, kind of under their shoulder. Uh, you really impressed me with his story when uh, we came up to see you that time. So I, I think that would really be cool for you to share that with the folks. Yeah, and that, that's there's some of that up on the Internet, too. K4VMY, he was a great builder. And, and builders are just few and far between. If you didn't see uh, two weeks ago on Ham Nation, please do. Go back and look at W0BT. He's still living. He builds stuff that's better than the manufacturers. It's unbelievable. This guy's something. Bill Decker was the same. Unfortunately, I didn't have video gear when I knew Bill. But Bill is the same story. And, and, and he'd get on 3875 uh, each night. And, and there would be bunches of us on there, and he would, he would, he would help us, and that was the whole thing. If you had a problem, you go, you get on thirty eight seventy five, you will find out because Bill was there, and not only him, there were a lot of other guys, and the, most of that crowd is now down on one hundred sixty meters, um, the AM window. Uh, that that was another thing. They were right in the middle of the AM window. You know, back in the sideband war. It was something in the 50s. You, you just have – I can tell you about it, and you will not understand it because you didn't live it. 
I'm telling you, it was a war. People would go to people's houses with axes and guns. I was serious. AMers and sidebanders, they hated each other. Of course, the AMers hated the sidebanders. Some of that's still happening, but there was a gentleman's agreement. Gentleman agreement. The AWOL didn't want to do anything. The FCC wasn't going to do anything. So a bunch of them that were, <laughs> a couple of them from Kentucky and a couple of them from Tennessee, they got pretty mean. And so we all sit down. Now we, I wasn't involved in it, but they sit down. Hams. Gentleman's agreement, 3870 to 3890 is going to be the AM window on 75 meters. 3870, 3890. And that was respected for decades. But then when a lot of people started coming in here 10 years ago or so, they didn't know about that gentleman's agreement, and they don't give a damn. I'm sitting on 3880, and I don't care who you are. I mean, that's their attitude today. I'm on 3890, I don't care. We get here every night. We own this frequency. No, you don't. And neither do the AMers. But it's respect out of that mode that doesn't have a specific place certified and as gentlemen, we certified it, but there's a lot of them that don't. They don't pay attention. But VMY was one of those guys that respected all of that, and he was a builder like no other. He, um, he actually, uh, in the war, taught uh, in, in classes of the Air Force and the Army uh, while he was in the, uh, in the service. He taught people how to fix radios and B-29s and B-25s and all that. And uh, he was a marvelous guy. He was great at shaping things and bending things and making his own chassis. But the neat thing about Bill Decker, his K4VMY, was that he would listen to you. No matter if you were licensed two weeks ago or had your license for 30 years, he would listen to you. He respected what you knew he respected what you didn't know and if he could help you he would and that was that was going on for years and i think that's what you were talking about uh ted he he helped people and it did it on the air i don't hear that anymore i just don't hear it and it's kind of sad because if you do do it and i've heard a couple try it they get stomped on and flamed because oh he's just a smart ass he's just telling you what he no, it's called sharing our experiences because a lot of this stuff is not learned in college. It's learned by doing every day. And lastly, one of the most precious things that has happened to me recently was that um, back in the uh, fall, well, actually it was December, I was given a Ph.D., an honorary degree, at the University of Missouri. And I was very honored by that. And it was a little bit crazy because my stepson took him 17 years to get his Ph.D. And um, at the luncheon of this event at the University of Missouri, the chancellor had a luncheon for us, and he sat beside me. I sat beside him. And he said, well, what do you think about this? And I said, well, <laughs> it's kind of crazy because I said – my stepson, it took him 17 years to get this degree. He said, yeah, so what? I said, well, here I was in two hours. He said, no, it took you 50 years. And I never thought about that before. And it comes back to what you're saying, Ted. I learned from the VMYs. I learned from the K0DGEs. I learned from the K0RIRs. All of these people... That took me under the wing. Paul Klipsch, my gracious, he was a giant. And he came to me wanting to learn something and in turn, of course, taught me lots. But he wasn't some comedian old jerk. He could have just cut me down like crazy, but he didn't. I was doing something he, he didn't know about and he wanted to see it. And in seeing all that, got the idea that I could help this young man and he did and I'm sharing that with all of you, and I hope you take it all in the right vein. It's, it, it, it's just been a wonderful life, and it continues on every day. And I hope that all of you can get more out of amateur radio than just turning on a radio and talking. There's so much more to it. And uh, I hope that through the years that, that it will come to you. 
One of the things I did is I wrote several textbooks. I've written six of them. The last one, this is it. If you haven't seen this book, the Heil Ham Radio Handbook, it's got stuff in it you'll never find in any other handbook. Why? Because it's all kinds of stuff that I just copied off from my mentors, like K0TG K- and VMY. These are all old diagrams of how to do stuff, how to wind a coil. And you're going to say, well, I don't need to do that. Yes, you do. Somewhere along the way, you could build your own ballon. You could make things happen, and that's what this book's all about. Yeah, it's about a lot of the new stuff, too. But... It- <sighs> Books today are, they're not that way. They're, they don't talk about what's, what needs to be talked about. Here's one of my best <laughs> deals. You're going to love this, Ted. Here shows a little guy sitting at the base of a tower, and on top of that tower is a dummy load. <laughs> his transmitter's connected to that dummy load on top of his tower. Did, did, he, make, did he make a contact? Is, SWR here is perfectly flat. <laughs> oh, boy. And just because you have a f- perfect match does not mean the antenna works. Oh, oh, no, it's the door. This thing's working great. No, it's not. How do you know that? You see, that's what bugs me. A lot of people don't. I hear guys all the time arguing and, oh, my God, my SWR is 1.7. Oh, I just got to get it to 1.1. They waste months getting perplexed over this. You know, Bob, when I when I started 51 years ago, we didn't even have SWR meters back then. We just threw something in the air and we talked around the world, you know. Yeah. I tell a lot of people that they'll call me and email. Yeah. I have so many. I go a couple hundred a day. Never, I try never to had a walk meter. That little Harvey Wells has worked in the more stupid antennas in the world. And guess what? We didn't. Like, you're right. We didn't have SWR meters. Didn't know what they were. Had a light bulb. Yeah, that I was, was gonna, a cool. I was going to say. Take a fluorescent light. And find my, out. My watt meter. My watt meter was a hundred <laughs> watt light bulb. Yeah. yeah. But oh golly, so much. Do you remember? Fun. Bob, do you, do you remember, though, that when you were younger, at least with me, <clears throat> ham radio was such a resource. We didn't have Internet. You know, we didn't have, there wasn't ways to find out technical things. But you could get on, on ham radio. You could, you could ask in a group how the shutter worked on your Pentax camera. Somebody would yeah. jump out of the crowd and answer the question. You could ask right. about a phono cartridge for your stereo, you know, or yep. how to get rid of a hum or something. These guys were everywhere, and they knew everything. It was like a whole world of Mr. Wizards. And I'll tell you, I really miss that. I do, too. I really do. And it, Because you never know who's listening and who's out there. And, and today, they don't give it the, the thought. They just go to the Internet, and uh, that's kind of sad because it's, it's, there's, so much, there's so much knowledge in amateur radio. you got every facet. And it, it, it's, it's a wonderful hobby. And that's why I give so much back in this ham nation effort. Boy, that takes a lot of time. But we need to do it. And that's why I just love what you are doing, Tom. You have to support this stuff. Now, there are some of these things, and they're just there to – I don't know what they're there for. Ego does terrible things to people, I think. <laughs> a lot of it is for that. Oh, I got my own radio show. Yeah, right. Well, who are you helping? What do you – what can we do here to make this thing better? And a lot of them don't care about that. Well, you know, Bob, I, do, I, I, uh, I uh, probably spend nearly all my time trying to get the ham radio message out. I, I have very little time for hamming myself. I want to try to <laughs> to uh, manage my time better. I've got to get some help on this show to help us do a lot of things. Ted's been a, Ted's been a great help here uh, with us, but the, this show is really expanding a lot, and I need cameramen, I need audio guys, I, I need all kinds of people, and, you know, we'll uh, we'll build it up, I guess, at some point, and I tell you, we watch Ham Nation, and uh, I love the show, and uh, for all our uh, uh, viewers out there and listeners, uh, that's on tomorrow night at 8 o'clock Central Time yeah. on the Twit yeah. Network. You can, go, you can go see it anytime, just put yeah. Ham Nation into Google, and you'll see all the shows down the left side. And uh, what's going on? Your, your story, your story tonight, I think, has been a, a great story, and 
it, it's, I think, gone over well, even to our shortwave listeners. It's a story that's just amazing for people to, to listen to. It's, a, it's almost unbelievable. If I didn't know you, I'd say, hey, Bob, you're making up all this stuff. But, uh, hey, you know, this, this, this did happen, man. And uh, you, uh, you lived the life here. And uh, uh, we really appreciate you sharing those stories with us. And there's so much more that I'd like to know uh, on here. Maybe, maybe you know, four or five, six months down the road, we'll have you back on again if, uh, if you'd like to, to join us. Sure, anytime. And then just get a list of questions and we can start. Over. Sure, sure. <laughs> uh, hey, Ted, uh, do you have anything specific that you want to bring up? And uh, there's some pictures. Uh, did you want me to load those pictures, Ted? Uh, you you can if, if if you want to. Okay. But I, I was just going to make a suggestion. I had tried. Maybe I put a little little pressure on Bob here now. That's <laughs> what we ought to do, though, we really ought to plan an organ concert with Bob playing and broadcast it on WTWW, the International Shortwave Station, for people all over the world, and talk about the fact that Bob is a ham, and that his interest in organs and everything really came out of ham radio i think that would make and, and have him you know, i'd like to see him I don't, I don't know if you've got access to one of them big huge organs bob but uh it would be fun to watch you show off for 30 minutes on the radio or <laughs> or over or over uh, over the internet uh he had sent me a whole group of songs that we played during christmas time and um we got requests for them they were really really good very well put together and uh they they weren't the typical you know they were outside the box Christmas carols with uh, with Bob Heil at the organ. Well, this this organ is out in my studio, and uh, I did uh, I've done two CDs on it, and uh, I have groups come in and I play. Uh, oh, a couple times a month we do it here uh, when I'm here in my Missouri uh, residence out in the Ozarks. Uh, country and i'm very blessed we have a wonderful studio it was here it was uh, uh, built apartments in a outbuilding for missionaries to live in the guy that owned his house before me and uh, so i love playing and uh, i'd be glad to do that the problem i have is i don't have internet here in the house and uh, i might have to work on that get one of the exceed guys to put us a drop out there because all of this is happening from exceed as it is with you, Tom, we're so blessed to have Exceed because I would have no internet here, none, zero. Mm-hmm. When I bought this house, there was no internet, there was no cell phone. And well, I bought it knowing that. And two weeks after I bought it, oh, Harry called me and said, we're on the air because I knew it was coming. And we were one of the first up on Exceed. And then I put up my own cell phone repeater and, hey, I'm good. So um, we get a drop out there and do that. We'll, we'll, we'll think about that. That would be fun, Ted. But as I said, the reason I haven't done it is I don't have a feed out there and it wasn't, wouldn't reach to the house. But we'll see what we can do about that. Well, you know, you know the, the QSO show is really versatile. So we, yeah. we, could do, we could do an organ QSO show at some point in time. That would be just perfect because... Our shortwave listeners, they love everything. So uh, (laughs) just keep that in mind. Well, I'm going to have to go, everybody, because they're going to be calling me here. I was supposed to go in at 930 on uh, 40 meters. and Boy, this uh, Ham Nation, it's our 200th show a week from tomorrow. And this is the special event that the guys have put together. Pile-ups are immense. They're giving out certificates and so on to work the five stations and so on. So I got to go get my cold nose into there and... uh, fire up some of the stuff but thanks very much tom and ted it's good to hear from you i hope your family's doing well and greetings to all of the listeners out there in tom's audience and we'll catch up somewhere yeah bob i, uh, I really appreciate you, you coming on over here with yeah. these dials <laughs> appreciate you being you on here with us tonight on, and we'll you see you tomorrow night we'll see you on ham nation tomorrow night yeah from right here you can find me on 3885 every morning from about 9 to 10:30 a.m. 3885 and i'm on 7295 a lot then during the afternoon on 40 on a.m. that's where i am i'll have to put my rig on a.m. and try it there you go all right thanks a lot bob appreciate it okay well thanks everybody this has been fun and uh hope we didn't bore you to death and we'll uh return sometime soon and I'll go from there. I'm headed off to 40 meters.
All right. Thanks, Bob. And uh, 73, we'll see you later. Enjoyed it. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Well, I think that was a good interview with uh, Bob. I mean, the guy's got some life. I, I, I tell you, it's, it's, it's amazing. Hey, hey, Ted, I loaded these pictures of the shortwave station. You want me to just run through them real quick? And, uh, sure, if you want to. Just, that, uh, a lot of folks have asked for pictures. Yeah, and, uh, and, and maybe this will be a little teaser. Let's tell them that we're going to do a whole show about the shortwave station here in the near future. Maybe we'll have some videos and some tours, and, uh, but this is just to be a little teaser. Now, I don't have them in a certain order, so I'm just going to put them up here, and you can kind of tell us what they are. Okay, let me see. Uh, well, we'll just start here. What does that look like? All righty. I, I can't see if that's number one or number two. Can you see the uh, in the well, caption? Actually, uh, it, well, up on the top it, it, is a sign. Actually, it was number two. That's number two. Okay, that's the transmitter that you're listening to right now if you've got your radio tuned to uh, WTWW at 5085. And that's a, a Continental 418, and it's big. <laughs> yeah, I, I would <laughs> say it. I would say it is, Yeah. And uh, yeah. there, that, that's it. Is that whole thing the transmitter? It looks like it's pretty long. Yeah, it is. I, I tell folks it's a, just a little bit under the size of a city bus. Yeah, it looks like a bus. So, but, and that's, uh, that's what you're listening to right now. That is, um, that is a Harris. It's the equivalent to the 418. It's 100,000 watts. And uh, uh, that one is our number three transmitter. And the number three transmitter runs uh, the Bible in uh, seven different languages dramatized with music and sound effects and all that kind of stuff no preachers no nobody it's it's just the Bible that's a that's a plate transformer but it's Whoa. it's different um, yeah. I guess I want to say it's a different method um, there are there's windings on here each one of those windings puts out about 700 volts. And each one of those goes to a module. Now, hmm. this is on the Continental that you're listening to right now. And those modules, now that's the, um, <laughs> we're back to the hair. Yeah, I, I said, yeah, okay. Okay. Uh, each one of those 700-volt windings goes to an individual module. And there's stacks of them. And they are switched on and off by a logic device inside the transmitter. Uh, so we have basically pulse duration modulation. And so instead of a big, gigantic, you know, plate supply, uh, each one of those modules has 700 volts being fed to it, and those are all being switched on and off digitally by means of fiber optic. Uh, that looks like the number one, and it's exactly like yeah. number two. Yeah. It's a Continental 418. There, The two of them are, there's little differences in them. Um, that one originally came from Dallas. This uh, this is the modulator supply that you'll see the blue. If you can see the blue, those are the individual um, modules that uh, are switched on and off by the logic inside the transmitter. Hmm. So let's see. You've got to stay out of that cage when it's running. So. <laughs> I think you have a fence around it, don't you? Yeah, there's there's a fence if, if you couldn't yeah. see it. Yeah, you're back to back the to, number three okay, transmitter. Okay, number three. And that's also the number three, just okay. looking from the other other angle or other there's, side. There's and that's a, a, number one. I think number that's one. one. Yeah. Yeah. Let's see. Okay. Hang on a second. Let's see what we got here. We're revisiting. Oh, hey. Okay. Let's uh, let's let's let's. Here we go. Okay. That's uh, that's my son David. He is holding a final tube, and he he wants to look real cool. But I'm just going to tell you, he's straining every muscle in his body to lift this thing. Normally, these things are lifted by a hydraulic device. Mm. <laughs> People lift them up out of, the, out of the tube socket, you know, and put them in a box or take them out of a box and put them in the tube socket. But he's he's doing it by hand. And uh, I stood there just for a second before I shot the picture. And yeah. uh, he was like, come on, come on. <laughs> Hurry up and shoot it, right? All right. right. <laughs> That's the entrance uh, coming into WTWW, some iron gates there that um, are at the actual front of the property. There's acres out here, and I don't know how many acres there are, but we have to have, we have three full-size rhombics. Well, let's see, That's tube that again. tube sitting free by itself, and uh, they're heavy. That one's nice and shiny. 
that entire part that looks really shiny is submerged in water and it has to be distilled and then that water is pumped through a nuclear grade resin to keep it at zero conductivity so what's the model number of that tube uh ted do you know that is a four cv one hundred thousand c wow and um i'll just say this they're <laughs> They're not cheap, okay? I imagine so. When you, when you, I, I've often said the linear amplifier that an amateur owns should have a tube or tubes in it that if they go bad, you don't have to remortgage your home to replace the tubes. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, this one you'd probably have to remortgage your home to replace it. So wow. anyhow, and they go bad. I mean, over a period of time, there's only so much life on them. But uh, they put up this one here is responsible totally. For a full 100,000 watts going out the, out to the antenna. So, but their uh, the shortwave station is a is a, is a fun place to play. You just have to be very careful. <laughs> All right. So we're gonna uh, try to get uh, maybe Matt and David and you to put together some type of a tour or uh, s something uh, additional, right? So we can show the people the station. Yeah, and I, I think if we could pull off a live camera. Yeah. Then the folks in the chat room could ask a question, or if they wanted to see something in particular, you know, we could uh, zoom in and show them exactly what it is that we're talking about, or whatever they want to know. The next, next best thing to being there, I guess. Oh yeah. So, um, so Ted, did you say that that tube is in water? I guess it's water cooled. Yeah. It, it, there, I don't know. I think in the uh, reservoir, there's about. I'm going to guess and say thirty, thirty-five gallons. My son David would know because. Mm -hmm. They always, they, you should see these guys, <laughs> they go to Walmart and a couple of other places. You have to make three or four pit stops to buy distilled water. And they'll yeah. fill the entire back end of a van with just literally, you know, 50, oh, wow. 60, 70, 80 gallons. And um, we sure get some looks when we do that. Yeah. Well, hey, uh, I've got a couple. Uh, I've got another announcement or two to make real quick, uh, Ted. Uh, I don't know if you can see this, Ted, but uh, again, we talked about the Heard Island. I uh, just want to mention again, guys, uh, we're going to be sponsoring this Heard Island uh, de expedition in, in March. I want you to look at this picture. I just got this picture. This is a. Uh, this island is a glacier, basically. It's a volcano, but it's a glacier. Uh, it's south of India, about a thousand miles from uh, India. It looks like to me about the only place you could probably set up a a tent and is going to be up in this area right right in here. Um, there's no sticks, no wood, anything on this. You got to take everything you need, you know, uh, your your fuel and everything uh, with you. Temperature is going to be about freezing. The wind's going to be blowing 40 miles an hour. These guys are going to be out there for 21 days in March. And on this webcast and uh, our, our broadcast here, we're going to have live updates from them every Tuesday night from uh, Heard Island. So, uh, Ted, they've got one more opening there. Uh, I told them I would talk to you to see if you would like to go down there. I'm sorry. I had a, we had a loss in audio here, and I got distracted. So. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, I tell you, man, those guys, you know, it's going to be a, a scientific expedition, too. They uh, they feel like they're going to discover uh, some more species down here. So it's going to be ham radio, and, of course, they always mix in something else like, you know, um, scientific uh, research and uh, things like that. <clears throat> uh, so, you know, that, that's going to be interesting, Ted, to see uh, see how that comes along right right there. Um, so what else you got on your plate, Ted? Any announcements or anything you want to make or uh I, I can't think of anything right offhand other than the fact that we do have one thing happening uh and that is we are as of um july the 20th uh we have the art bell show coming on wtww he'll be on at night and uh the other thing i'd like to invite folks to listen not just to qso but on saturday and sunday nights if you've got a shortwave radio and you just want to have some fun tune in we could start at around seven o'clock eastern daylight time and um these are two music shows and we originally started out doing you know we started out doing oldies and then we started doing country because country was we're right here in nashville and i can get a lot there's a lot of artists that will come on and 
and talk and be guests and whatnot. But then we keep getting requests for oldies, so I said, to heck with it. We're just going to play whatever they ask for. So you might hear Loretta Lynn uh, followed up by the Eagles and followed up by uh, who knows what. <laughs> you know, so, I, think- I mean, it's whatever the folks ask for, that's what we're playing. Mm-hmm. I think it makes for a real interesting radio show, and it's something kind of missing from shortwave. Uh, well, you, today, you, and that you is music me. programming and entertainment programming. You introduced me to a new song. I've, I've been listening to the show some, and you introduced me to a song I'd never heard before, and I kind of like it. You know, I, I, what was it? I watched it on my radio. I've never heard that before until I heard your show. And that's uh, that's uh, Lionel Cartwright. I heard it on my, heard it on my radio. Yeah, I heard it. Starts- it. No, no, I heard it. Wait a minute. Not I heard it on the radio, was it? I saw it on the radio. Or oh, yeah, that's what it was. So, yeah, he, he talks about the fact that he had a transistor under his pillow. It starts <laughs> off like that, you know, and he yeah. was, and he watched it all on his radio. That's what that's what the oh uh, yeah yeah the, the theme of the song is. Yeah, Lionel Cartwright. I thought it was a really really great song, especially a good song for hams. You know. Yeah. Hey, one another thing coming up here real soon, and I, I'll throw a throw the background up here uh, for you guys. It's going to be Field Day. Field Day is going to be uh, July June. June 27th, 28th. Now, Ted, you usually do something uh, special on field day, don't you? We broadcast on field day. Um, it, 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 usually, it depended on times. In other words, um, what we could get available on the transmitter when there wasn't somebody else on. But we usually go, I mean, a long stretch, <laughs> 8, 12 hours sometimes. I don't know. We go a long ways. And we have people calling in from all over the country talking about their field day location and uh it's always amazed me i've always worried said oh i wonder if anybody's in a call this time we get flooded with phone calls and it's um it's so interesting to hear these folks and the intense interest that they have some people will take a cell phone around and pass it around their group and let each one get on and talk about what they're doing and of course they always have to talk about the chef you know what he's cooking and it's amazing. Some of these field day groups, they really go out for the food on field day. So um, on field day, if, you've got, if you're near a shortwave radio, uh, tune in and listen. If you're part of a group, be sure and call in. We'll have numbers up on the website and everything. But call in and talk about what your group is doing. And one of the reasons why we like to do this, and that is, I guess, somewhere in part 97, it says that amateur radio, the perp- one of the purposes of amateur radio, it mentions as one of the primary purposes, is to, in- uh, to enhance international goodwill. So part of us broadcasting amateur radio programming on shortwave is to enhance international goodwill. So field day is a perfect time, perfect day to hear all these hams having so much fun and uh, doing something that they really love. So what well, it's think- always fun. Let me tell you, I, I, I went to three locations last year. We we webcast that day or that two days. We hit one site in Tennessee, one in Mississippi, and I think we hit one in Alabama. And we went down to the Olive Branch uh amateur radio club down in uh, Mississippi. I don't know if you well, I don't know how the weather was where you were, Ted, but it was pretty bad. I think we got nine inches of rain that morning uh here. We went down there, and uh, they were up on the picnic tables holding the, the equipment down, and uh, they were really trying to survive. So it's more than ham radio. It's also survival uh, training in some cases. Well, I know that um, um, you know amateur radio, I would have to say, maybe the premier event. Of course, now folks that are contesters are going to say, even though field day is a contest, they may say that a contest is a different contest is the, is its primary event. But when you consider you're out in the middle of a field, and you try to tell this to somebody that's not a ham, you say, okay, we go out in the middle of a field or the woods or someplace. Not necessarily, though. We could be a parking lot, you know, and operate on generators and emergency power and solar power and batteries, and we see how many other ham stations we can contact within the day. And they'll give you some strange looks, you know. But if you can get them out uh, to do... Um, one of these uh, go-to stations to operate during field day, um, you'll see these people just light up. And I'm talking about young people, middle-aged people, old people. You sit them down in front of a microphone and coach them and tell them what to do, and they get on the air. It just it it blows their mind. They go away a changed person. 
Well, Ted, it's uh, been, uh, I think, a, a good broadcast tonight. Uh, we, we've uh, had some great discussions on here. We've, uh, we've been talking almost two hours, and uh, I think we're going to probably uh, try to terminate this part of the, uh, the uh, broadcast, and we're going to go to what we call um, our real amateur radio roundtable. That's where we invite people out in the field to click on a link, and they can actually join us here. And uh, they'll, your video will even will actually come up on the, the, the broadcast. So anybody out there that wants to join us, Kathy just sent a link out. If you click on that link and you've got a camera, uh, you can uh, join us and uh, just come in and sit and say hello or just listen if you don't want to say anything. We can take up to 10 people at a time. Uh, so, Ted, I'll, uh, I'll give you the last words, man. I appreciate you being on here and helping out tonight. Man, uh, we couldn't do it without you. Well, I, I appreciate you. Uh doing this too uh i think this is so important it was one of the things that bob heil brought up tonight and and you can see you know bob has a passion not just for the hobby but to pass it along to somebody else and i think that each and every one of us um should have that same passion to pass this hobby to someone else one of the greatest gifts you can give someone is getting them into the hobby of amateur radio because it's there's no other hobby like it. So other than that, I want to say that I think that should be our, each and every one of our, our, as amateurs, our goal is to try to take the hobby a little further. Pass it, even if you just pass it on to one more person. Um, I think that really, really is something special. Somebody asked in the chat room about the phone number for Field Day, and I was going to say we, we don't really know that uh until about a week beforehand we'll have it all over the website so don't worry about the number just you know go to the website and look and then you know participate well you have a good night yeah. hope your uh, your chat room goes well um you try to behave yourself tom all right <laughs> call me sometime all right all right thanks 73 Ted. and good night good good night to you okay well everybody hey that uh, pretty much wraps up our uh formal amateur radio roundtable tonight and uh, we're going to go to uh, to the informal part, invite everybody uh, to join us. And we'll keep the webcast up so all your friends can see you on a webcast. I don't know if anybody has noticed. I haven't been reading the chat room that much, but don't know if you've noticed or not. But the picture should be much clearer tonight. If you look at this picture here, hopefully we are in high definition mode. So, you know, take a look at this and see how it looks. And we're back to uh, being able to use our green screen now. For instance, if I wanted to be transported to, I guess that's the Enterprise. I could be on the Enterprise if I wanted to. Or if I wanted to go up to uh, Connecticut there, I could be just instantly at the uh, W1AW facility there uh, in Newington, Connecticut. So uh, we think we've done a major improvement there. We've got some more equipment ordered that's going to help this even work better and uh, be more stable and give you guys better pictures. But we are uh, we are in a uh, high def mode now. So I uh, hope, uh, hope you liked it. I hope it's looking good for you. I hope you're uh, okay with the chat room. Uh, it seems to be working pretty good. Uh, we, uh, we think we're going to be able to use it. Uh, we may have to do some internal building around it to do the things we want to do. Uh, but uh, as you can see tonight, uh, it looks like most people uh, are operating it uh, pretty good. I haven't heard of too many questions. Uh, and uh, Greg is on here. Greg uh, is the chat room guy. So you guys can say hello to Greg, and he can even get you, get you a chat room. <clears throat> so let's go over to... Uh, 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 radio roundtable now after radio roundtable and uh, I will uh, see if I can get on it's going to take me just a couple minutes to get on here well I see I see Dan in there and mm -hmm. there's a couple people uh, let me uh, get you guys on here uh, okay hey hey Dan how you doing doing good doing good all right, we got you in here, and we've got uh, uh, oh wow, we got Jeffrey in here. He's he's a, a regular now. Jeffrey, yeah, move your hands, make that camera uh, focus, man. Yeah, he's out of focus. Yeah, he'll get it there in a minute. He'll get it. <laughs> Working. 
working on it. And there comes there Mike. Comes Mike. Hey, we got Mike in here. Now where's Mike? Mike, where are you? His mic is muted. Where's Mike located? Canada. Oh, okay. He's a Canucker. He's a Canucker. Okay. Uh, yeah, Tom, your video was really, really good today. Oh, great. Okay. Very good. Uh, yeah, your video was very good. To, uh, uh, And yeah, Mike, to answer your question, yeah, we, we turned the antenna from the shop uh, to the uh, field day site. Are you, uh, do you do um, field day not far from your place, right? No, actually, it's uh, uh, well about uh, 10 miles from, the, from my place. Okay. I just hope we don't have Africa heat like we did last year. Oh. No, I, I, the the thing with, with us is uh, by us it rained uh, <clears throat> the uh, night uh, of field day, and that was no fun, let me tell you. We've already had hail uh, mm. at our field day site. Hail? Hail, yep. Oh, hail. Hey. That's so, not fun. So Jeffrey, uh, you gotta yes, get sir. you gotta we gotta help Jeffrey fix this problem. Anybody got any ideas? What? I'm working on it. Is he gonna I'll plug on the me. microphone and plug it back in? Hey, look at there. We've got a special guest from India. They just Skyped in. Hey Jolty, how you doing? Hello, Jolty. Jolty. Hi Jolty. I gotta figure out how to turn the well, Jolty's not talking. I've never had this problem before. Hey, down in your uh, little tray down at the bottom right of your on your monitor, do you have anything that shows a a, a cam? Sometimes. Uh, well, I got I got the mini cam. Yeah, let me you see. You might you might click on it, look at properties. Yeah, I'm usually pretty good at this, but um. Yeah. Well, hey. Yeah, it happens to all of us. And yeah. Especially, you gotta, you gotta, you gotta, yeah. Hey, Jolty, how you doing down in India? Yeah. Welcome. Yeah. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, I hear you. Yeah. What time is it in India today? Yeah, I, I hear you. What time is it? Yes. Uh, it looks like he's frozen now. No, Jolty's, yep. he's he's still there. Hey, Jolty, I hear you. I'm going to disconnect. Okay. I didn't disconnect. Let me do this. There's Glenn in. Who's that? Oh well, we got uh, we got Glenn Popel join us, uh, KW5 GP. Hey, he finally got my call right. Yeah, man, he's uh, he's our uh, our our Duino guy. And and hey, hey, Glenn won uh, best best prize or something on his Arduino project for uh, up at Hamvention uh, this year. Yeah, that little uh, JT65 cube that I built took uh, best in show at the. Uh, QRP Arky four days in May uh, homebrew competition. Oh, very cool. So, yeah. Dayton's still a blur. <laughs> oh, it always is. It always is. Uh, but it was fun. I've got so I got so much video to go through yet. So, so Glenn, how's the cat? How's the cat doing? I know you took the cat to surgery or something uh, last day or two. Yeah, uh, she's hanging in there. She had to have four teeth pulled, uh, and just she's eighteen, so you know you're fighting the eighteen-year-old stuff issues. Right now, she's hanging in there. Yeah. Hey, your hair looks like it's on fire. Yeah. Old age. Static. You must have a light on right above you. Yeah. 
Well, Jolty, Jolty, can you hear me? Yeah, I can. Yeah, I hear you. Yes. How are you doing in India to, this morning? Uh, it's very hot. 35 degrees Celsius inside yeah. the room. So. I hear, so I hear that it's been very hot there, that many people are dying from the heat. Yeah, over 200 people already died. Oh, man. India. What, what time is it there right now? It's about half past 8 in the morning, 8.35. Oh, okay. Yeah, I think you said 8.35. Your, uh, your, your uh, audio is a little echoey. It's a little, little hard to understand. It's probably the internet connection. But I am hearing you. Okay. Yeah. Well, thank you for your detailed message. Uh, I thoroughly enjoyed it. Okay, what well, what was that you enjoyed? Uh, your Dayton. <laughs> oh, okay, yeah, the Dayton, yeah. We had Mr. Suri and uh, a, a number of India uh, people from India uh, were on our show. I, I hope you got to see them. Yes, yes. But it was all it was burning my midnight oil, but it all worked. Uh, uh -huh. I've been there uh, ago, two years ago, and uh, it was good. Well, for those uh, for those uh, uh, still watching the show out there, and we got about 55 people. Uh, this part of the show is called Hangout, or it's called Amateur. It's called Roundtable. We're using Google Hangout actually for it, so we can have up to 10 people uh, on here. And if you look at the bottom of the picture that you're getting, you'll see the pictures across the bottom of the different people that have connected in. Uh, we can have up to 10 people that, that can connect. Uh, looks like we have room for more. So if anybody uh, wants to join us, let me send that link again. So there's the link again if anybody would like to join us. Again, you have to have a Google account to join. But uh, I'm using the Hangout uh, ca uh, camera right now. It's not too bad of a picture. This is what we're seeing on the uh, Hangout. You can see across the bottom, you can see different people. There's me, uh, Mike, uh, Jolty in India. We're coming on down to, let's see. Well, there's Dan there at the back on the, on the end. And uh, just to give you guys a little idea of what, uh, what the place looks like, we're using a ham shack uh, for our studio. Uh, you can see the workbench is pretty much uh, uh, kind of tied up here with a lot of stuff. So this is our uh, this is our workbench. There's our uh, one of our wireless mic systems over there. Our, one of our phones for incoming calls. Uh, we bring Skype in on this uh, PC right here. We bring everything through a audio mixer. We go from an audio mixer into a a encoder. Everything everything on the encoder here is uh, uh, software driven. Every, all the different camera shots are are selected by a mouse. Uh, there's a lot of configuration, a lot of different things you can do here. And then uh, I've got another PC here that has uh, uh, the uh, chat room on in it. You can see the uh, the little teleprompter right there. I, I don't know that you can see. Yeah, you can't see any writing on it, but there's our uh, there's a little teleprompter. There's our camera. Uh, monitor on the wall there. We've got uh, some studio lights on in here. And then we come around to, this is the operating operating position right here. And uh, that's, uh, that's about it uh, as far as a tour. So let's see, did Jeffrey get his uh, thing fixed here? I don't know, he's gone. Oh, he's there. You can see me. I'm not. I can't. Uh, I'm not getting anything clear. No, all I see is please start mini cam, mini cam. Yeah. I'm working on it. Yeah. Okay. Well, we'll just hang in here. You'll get it. Hey, Tom. Yeah. Question for you. Yeah. What what are, what are those studio lights that you're using? They look LED. No, they're actually. Uh, uh, it's a. 
fluorescent. They, they've got five. They, I think they've got. Let's see. One, two, three, four. They got five bulbs in there. They're the little curly Q. They're the little curly Q uh, bulbs that, that screw in. You know, it, it's a it's a studio light, but the temperature. You know, different temperatures give different colors. I think those are fifty five hundred. Uh, you, oh, you're just seeing the front of them, but uh, hey, you, those things are fairly cheap. Uh, those boxes, I think I bought that set there. It included the ten bulbs for maybe sixty, seventy bucks. And uh, on the back, on the back, it's got five switches on each light to turn each lamp on individually. That's pretty cool, and you've got two of those, eh? When I, when I've got two one. of those. I could probably get by without them. I've got a, quite a bright uh, fluorescent up here over the workbench, and we've got fluorescent over there, which which I've got bulbs in that give a pretty uh, natural or a white light. So uh, I think I could get by now. Of course, with the green screen, uh, it helps to have a little bit more light, but. Uh, they seem to be doing okay, and after we went with uh, our high def connection here, uh, things just look a lot better. Of course, I was surprised at how bad it, the previous webcast looked, uh, running the compo composite video. You know, it's almost hard watching you now after watching you in high def earlier, and the lighting was uh, the lighting was perfect too. What you mean tonight? Yes. Well, that's that's good. Glad to hear that. I, you know, I'm right now, and I've got I've got the I've, I've got the uh, green screen on right now. If you're looking at the webcast, but I really, once we went with the high def box to connect the camera to the uh, encoder here, it pretty much instantly got rid of all that uh, shadowing that we were having. I just I, I never could get the lighting right. Uh, I thought it was a lighting problem because you could move. I could move lights, and I could change the shadowing a little bit around around my head in places. But once we went from the composite video to a 720p or 1080p, that shadowing just went away. We're not even doing anything special with lighting now. It just went away. And, and I didn't I didn't notice any halo. Like normally, uh, sometimes you'll see a halo around the. Uh, People uh, that are in front of the green screen, I didn't see any of that tonight on you at all. I didn't even know you were on a green screen. Well, yeah. I did, but you couldn't tell. Well, that's, that's good to know. Uh, I hope that our, our, our viewers out there notice the, uh, the improvement because I, I'm, really, I'm really happy with at least what I can see here, you know, uh, locally. You know, I mean, that's a, there's a good shot of uh, W1AW. There's a there's a shot right there. I'm in uh, I'm in our studio right now. Look at how you like that studio. You may not be seeing it, but that's uh that's our studio shot right now. Uh, let's see with those bulbs. Do I get a lot of RF? No, I, I don't seem to. We got a lot of yeah. people. A lot of people calling you tonight here. Yeah, and especially you having a white shirt on tonight too. Sometimes that uh, throws off the white balance, but uh, it was it was spot on. Yeah. Well, I'm using the shirt for white balance tonight. Did I break my camera? I've been trying to adjust the white balance. But yeah. Here's a. Hey, here's a picture of my green screen. I don't know if you notice anything about it or not. You'll see it in just a second. This is my green screen. What happened to Mike? Well, Mike just doesn't have a camera, I guess. Right. Yeah, unfortunately, uh, this this laptop doesn't have a camera in it, so I have no video. Oh, he has no camera. So this is my green screen. Do you notice anything about my green screen? It's blue. Yeah, I'm, we're using blue screen. And you know what? Uh, hey, watch this. Let me go to green screen. I want to show you something. I got blue jeans on, so this should be uh, interesting. Let's see. This should be uh, this should be interesting. Watch this. 
<laughs> well, you know, it's a little bit different color blue, but uh, it almost takes them out. There's a shot of my, since I can't show my radio station, it's over to the right of me. I needed a background. And what I have directly behind me is a window. That's the only way I can uh, uh, orient things in here. So I, I, I have trouble having a studio here. So I've got an ugly window behind me. But uh, by using, you know, the green screen, blue screen behind me, it... Uh, it it helps us, you know, with a much better look. What you don't realize is that room he's in is tiny. You know, it, it it's getting tinier. I mean, Glenn was here. We did a, a webcast on Arduino here, but you know, hey, Glenn, you know, at my other house, my ham shack was three times the size. I had we when we did the D Star show from my room, I had like eight people in there. And we had over 30 computers networked in that room. And I had this, this workbench, the uh, workbench that you're seeing here. Um, uh, let me see. How do I get back to this? Let's see. The, uh, the workbench that you're seeing right, right here. Uh, when I moved here, I cut six feet of it off. It was six feet longer. Uh, so I lost. It's, it was 16 feet long. And... Uh, uh, I uh, so yeah, I'm. It's cramped in here. You know, I. You know, we'd be doing good if we could get a couple, three people in here. But you can see, uh, it's pretty, pretty junky in here. You know, I haven't even gotten unpacked from Dayton yet. I've still got stuff in boxes all in the kitchen and in the hallway uh, from Dayton that we have not even put away yet. Oh, I don't even want to go there. I mean, we got field day in two or three weeks, and. Uh, I got to turn around and get all the the rigs and stuff ready for that. Yeah, uh, I may try to come down and see you guys field day, and we might do a webcast from down here. I don't know. Well, hopefully we won't be sitting there in the two or three inches of water we were standing in last time. Yeah. What you don't realize is when Tom was talking about the Olive Branch location, we were on a small, I don't want to call it a hill, but we were higher than the surrounding terrain and the concrete pad of our pavilion had literally an inch to an inch and a half of water in it from all the rain yeah the only thing it was having a good time that day uh were the ducks the ducks were out when i drove up and found you guys we had to stop and let the ducks by oh gosh they were having fun yeah Yep. But it was a good good proof of the lightning detector. That sucker was going off the whole night. 